More evidence for evolution comes from things like morphological structures or the anatomy of organisms. For example, you see here a representation of a transition animal or a hypothesized animal that exists between the mammals that evolve on land and the entrance of the mammals back into the water with things like the whale and the dolphin family. So you were looking for something like this or a transition fossil that could possibly explain how that could happen. And there's a, there was a lot of contention for a long time about the lack of a transition fossil to actually explain that. But actually, the fossil record is plenty of evidence of such things. And in fact, you see this particular animal here represented that actually has um, on his hind structure here, the high fin or the flipper or whatever you want to call it of the, of the animal, has a very close similarity to the structure of a leg. Oh, and you see the digits, the, the knees and everything else, the elbows, everything very similar to the formation of a leg. That is what we call a homologous structure or a similar structure in a different organism that indicates common ancestry with an organism uh, that has a, that similar structure. And in this case, it's indicating that this particular animal may have been a transition animal between the mammals that evolved on land and the mammals that we see today in the water. Also, this is an example of something we call a mosaic structure, something that evolved for a purpose but ends up being used for a different purpose. For example, that was not as originally evolved for actually propulsion or steering in the water. It was evolved for ambulation or walking on land or support. But then this structure became used for a different purpose as the animals evolved into the water. So both examples actually are examples that substantiate evolution. Mosaic structures show you that sometimes the functions that show up in, in life can actually be reused for different kinds of functions. And also, homologous structures show you connections between different animals. Now, you can uh, see another example here of a transition uh, between the land and the water for mammals, which is one of the most contended points in evolution. So you see here how the evolution from a terrestrial mammal could have subsequently, little by little, reach the our recent alien, uh, whale ancestor. And you see, though, how there's a lot of homology between them, how the structures of the limbs are going to be um, remained in there, even as it's becoming mostly aquatic. Now, notice now how it days the flipper that is on the front of the whale. This is an actual ancestor. But you see how it's there, there still pretty much the structure of a, a four being, right? You still have the similar rib cage. You still have the similar spinal cord. And even a similar number of actual spinal cords. But notice how the pelvic and the high limbs actually were devolved since they're no longer necessary anymore. And this is what we're going to be calling a vestigial structure or a remnant of what used to be a piece that used to be useful for your ancestor. Yet another piece of evidence for evolution. Vestigial structures are structures that no longer serve a purpose, but that they used to serve a purpose on your ancestor. So they're remnants of privileged evolutionary steps. And they're there still because they haven't been disadvantageous enough that they actually were selected against and still they're, they're still around. But if a whale that is lacking that bone altogether becomes more likely to survive, then eventually that bone will go away altogether as it is almost completely gone in many of the whale species of today. Now you see how this is the transition that I'm talking about and you can track the homology across them. Here's another example of homologous structures. You see now the cat, the whale, the bat, and the humans are all mammals. Look at the similarity in the bone structure of their limbs. And even though evolution actually changed that structure uh, throughout time, there's actual homology in that structure. There's very close similarity to the number of bones and even the position of bones, even if the size of the bones is slightly different because each of these animals were under different evolutionary pressures which caused changes in that. Overall, the structure is very similar. And that gives you an ex example that that may have been common ancestry between these two animals. The same thing is true about molecular similarities. When you actually track proteins found in different kinds of animals, you see that there's a very close similarity between domains or areas of these proteins that fulfill similar functions. So there's molecular homology as well as physiological or anatomical morphology. 
all right, or homology in this case. But remember, homologous structures is what we call similarities in structure, which gives you evidence that the animal may have shared a common ancestor. Another kind of, of anatomical similarity is actually DNA or amino acid sequences. Now remember that a protein sequence is going to be determined by the DNA sequence. So when you see protein similarities, you're really seeing at the same time DNA similarities. But either way, look at the fact that about 95% there's a similarity between um, rhesus monkeys and humans. But the mouse is about 87% similar to humans. A chicken is 69% similar to humans. A frog is 54% similar to humans. A lamprey is 14% similar to humans. What is that telling you? It's telling you that we share a little bit of common ancestry with the lamprey because we have some similarities in protein and DNA structures with the lamprey. But we probably are closely related to the rhesus monkey than we are to rats or mouses because our DNA or protein sequences are more similar to the rhesus monkeys than to the mouse. So you can actually use this as a way to create associations between animals and track the uh, taxonomy or the timeline or the split of the tree of life. And we'll talk at the at another video about DNA as a as a evidence for molecular evolution, and how this is one more thing that you can actually use for that. So again, homology is going to exist both at molecular level and at the astrophysiological or morphological level to actually see that we have similarities with other animals. That that means that we actually share ancestors with that, and we clearly share an ancestor with the rhesus monkey closer in time than we share an ancestor with the mouse because we are closer to the monkey than we are to the mouse. So what that means is that you can probably use this kind of thing to actually track how long ago our ancestor split from the ancestor that will end up making the rhesus monkey. In other words, how long ago the split between whatever became the monkey branch of the tree and the human branch of the tree came about. Notice that I'm not saying that we came from monkeys. I'm saying that us and monkeys came from the same common ancestor. And that somewhere deeper within the tree, there's also a split that led to the family that became the rats and the family that became the humans and the monkeys. But this split must have happened before since we share less similarity with the mouse than we actually share with the monkey. So you see how you can use this process to track evolution across time and actually create a relationship between the animals. And it has everything to do with either anatomical morphological similarities or um, actual molecular similarities in terms of protein or DNA sequences. Another kind of anatomy thing that you can actually see is something that actually proves evolution without being comparing the similarities in a sense of common ancestry. It's comparing similarities in, this, in the opposite sense, the sense of common pressure. So look at, for example, the, the wings of different kinds of, of things. You have the wings of birds, the wings of bats, and the wings of insects. Now certainly they've been blown up to be sh similar size, but you can see a lot of, of similarity between the overall structure of these things. You can see that all of them have increased in surface areas, all of them have uh, support systems, all of them have um, what you call air lines, which is basically connections between the support se sequences. And these things you can actually see that are similar in construction. Why? Because they're similar in a function. Remember that in biology, forms fits function. So the bird, the bat, and the fly all have to fly. And so they have similar structures because life, um, in all cases, evolve convergently into that structure. In other words, that means all of them needed to fly. All of them developed a structure that's similar because all of them uh, needed to develop some sort of device to, to actually create lift. And the wing, in this case, as we do in airplanes, copying life is the best example to do that. And so flying is a common pressure on these animals. The ability to fly gave them an edge. And since all of them wanted to develop the ability to fly, all of them developed similar structures. This is what we call analogous structures. This is similar structures in organisms which are different from each other, but do not care a share a common ancestor. Since the, but they have a shared evolutionary trait. But it's not because they have a strong common ancestor. It's because they lived under similar environmental pressures. So this is called analogous structures. And that too proves evolution. 
homologous structures proves evolution because it shows that people have common ancestors. So it shares the whole, uh, it proves the whole adaptive radiation thing. Analogous structures proves evolution because it proves that pressure from the environment causes selection towards a certain trait over many generations. So either way you look at it, anatomy can be used to actually see this. And just like homo homology uh, existed at the molecular level, analogous structures also exist at the molecular level. Animals that do not share common ancestors sometimes have similar proteins because in both cases the pressure was the same and different the same protein evolved in different in the same situations blood types among apes is a good example of that it, it seemed that the, the the blood type that was the original ancestor for humans for example was the a blood type and that is also common in in, in some monkeys showing that's a homologous feature among us and many of the other simians and other apes but some other apes also have the B blood type or something similar to the B blood type. And that must have evolved after we split. And that means that that is going to be an example of an analogous structure, something that evolved at the same time, maybe because of the same kind of pressure. Notice how the hind legs of kangaroos or grasshoppers or even humans are all developed with similar structures to, to create propulsion or jumping ability. Now, even though the animal's jumping ability will vary, clearly the grasshopper is way better at it than, than the kangaroo is or than we are. Either way, similar structures evolve for similar purposes, even though they do not share a common ancestor that has that feature. By the way, how can you tell that something that has looks the same is analogous and not homologous? Well, it's very simple. You look at the tree of life and you look at the most common shared ancestor. Now, you ask yourself, did this common ancestor have a certain feature? Let's say, for example, another split happened there. Okay, now, you'll notice, for example, that it's animal A, animal B, and animal C over here. Now, animal A um, developed a certain trait, and so did animal C. However, animal B did not evolve the trait. Okay, now, they, all of these animals share a common ancestor. So if this was a homologous feature, it would be more likely that all of them may have had it. Um, unless something happened in B to select against that feature. Like it happened in the whales with the lag, lag bones and stuff like that. The pelvic bones. But if that's not the case, if there's no evidence for uh, with transition fossils to show you that in this branch of life, the trait was devolving or, or actually being selected against then it's more likely that the trait that shows up in A and C evolved separately in this branch and on this branch. And that is an example of analogous structure. For example, we see uh, wings in the bat, the fly, and the bird. But if you think about how, what was the, low, the closest common ancestor that bats, wings, of, of birds and wings of, bat and of, of flies have in common, you got to go back all the way to invertebrates. And that's way too many animals in between the tree of life that do not have wings. In other words, it's not a homologous structure. It evolves separately in each of these animal groups because of environmental pressure.